and welcome to the Singerman Experience. My name is Ann Mosley. I'm the Director of Engagement as well as the Curator of the Singerman Experience. And tonight we present a great program on Julius Rosenwald and the power of education, um, or as the main title suggests, the big bets on social change. Uh, this month, the Singman Experience has been highlighting on its Trailblazer series, a series of African Americans that have made a huge impact uh, within Singman County. And we are building on that uh, by discussing Julius Rosenwald, the effect uh, that he had on the nation and his original upbringing here in Springfield, Illinois. And uh, as we go through the talk tonight, if you have any questions, feel free to place them in the comments and we'd be happy to address them at the end of the program. In addition to discussing Julius Rosenwald um, and his life and legacy, we will be talking about the Rosenwald schools, the power of social change, and the effects that it can have on our communities and making us more united um, in the shared bond of the love of education and bettering others. Um, tonight, I have the great honor to introduce our special guest, uh, Catherine Harris. Uh, she is the former director of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. She is also an amazing librarian and love of books. Uh, she has a vast uh, history of working with the Illinois Historical Library. She also serves on the board for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. Uh, she serves on the Springfield Rotary and uh, this past year uh, was known as the Citizen of the Year. So without, without further ado, Katherine Harris. Hi, Catherine. Hi. So uh, as we start off the program tonight, again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments. Uh, we will be uh, discussing Rosenwald throughout the evening and the Rosenwald schools and the newest addition to the National Park Service. And as we go through, uh, we will be showing you images as well as a number of interesting facts about Rosenwald and his legacy. But before we get started on that, uh, Catherine, you're a part of an amazing museum that's going to be opening soon. Um, sadly, COVID has kind of restricted a lot of our institutions, but we're so happy to know that um, our museums are opening back up. Can you tell us a little bit more? Annie. I'm uh -huh. having some technical difficulty I end here. I keep going in and out. So why don't you let me go away for a minute and you take over. I, I apologize. Now, right now, things seem to be good. But who knows what might happen next. So <laughs> maybe we'll just stay here and go with oh. <laughs> Well, if you have any you issues, Catherine, let me. Are you all good now? You kind of broke up there. I probably broke up too. Hmm. Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit. Yeah, I'm sorry. So. Uh, why don't I, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure how to move on. Audience folk, technology is wonderful when it works. And today on my end, it's not working hundred percent. So just bear with me. I might move to a different place. What do you, what do you think, Annie? Sure, um, I'll take you away for a moment and I'll introduce uh, the museum that you are volunteering at. So uh, as Catherine uh, gets ready for uh, our program tonight, um, thank you so much for your patience in uh, having us uh, get through some of our technological glitches. I know with uh, COVID, we've had to do a lot of things virtually and your patience is very much appreciated. Now, 
Uh, Catherine is a volunteer at the African American Museum here in Springfield, Illinois. And due to COVID and the weather, uh, the museum has been closed for a short amount of time, uh, but they're actually gonna be opening back up starting uh, in the next few weeks. And so I encourage you to go to their Facebook page and their website uh, to check out um, their hours because they'll be uh, announcing that here pretty soon. And they also have an amazing newsletter that I uh, recommend that you look at. Uh, it provides an insight into the African-American community uh, that made up Central Illinois. Also, they've done a lot of amazing work on researching the colored section of Oak Ridge Cemetery. In addition to that, um, they have a wonderful exhibit highlighting um, a number of individuals who lived here in the area, including some of the individuals that we have discussed on our past programming this month, such as uh, Major George Ford, as well as, uh, let me see, I believe Z.W. Mitchell is not in their exhibit, but they have brought up Faith Logan, uh, who we talked about uh, yesterday. So if you get a chance uh, to check out some of their amazing exhibits, I encourage you to come out and take a look. I know that they've had the Freedom Project over there, and uh, they are always working on a new exhibit to showcase uh, the life and legacy of those who lived here in Illinois. Now with the Sangamon experience, uh, we're working on our um, hometown, hometown pride exhibit. Uh, so if you have any questions about those, I'll do that at the end as well. Uh, but it's gonna be a digital exhibit that will be presented uh, in March. Um, and I'll get to that at the end of the program. Uh, we have so many things coming up that uh, it's so easy to uh, lose track of time because things just come one after another. And if you have any questions or forget uh, what we talked about in regards to this evening, uh, you'll be able to come back and take a look at it. So I'm going to get us started uh, while Catherine is uh, getting ready. Um, as we can tell with the Rosenwald story, it's become a bit more exciting uh, because Rosenwald, while uh, hasn't had a lot of attention over the past few years, he has drawn the attention of the National Park Service and has always been of interest uh, here in central Illinois because his home was actually here in Springfield and can be seen at uh, the Lincoln neighborhood site. And there's a whole history to that home to begin with, uh, besides just the Rosenwald story, but it has made some headline news because uh, the National Park Service has decided to add Rosenwald sites to the National Park Service. And that bill was actually passed uh, in January. And we were very fortunate to have our very own uh, Dick Durbin uh, bring that to the Senate and have it presented and have it signed by the president into law. So uh, the uh, National Park Service is highlighting uh, the Rosenwald legacy and they've done a huge uh, historic research on the project itself. And it's a very notable uh, cause to look into uh, because Rosenwald, while living in Springfield, had a, uh, a keen effect on his life thanks to his family, uh, but also just being uh, alive during the early part of the 20th century and living around uh, the legacy of Abraham Lincoln, but also living in a time of uh, a racial divide within the country and here within central Illinois. Uh, we don't normally think of uh, the land of Lincoln being a centerpiece for one of the biggest race riots in our nation's history, uh, but it was. And so Rosenwald grew up in the midst of all of that here in Springfield. Now, uh, Springfield was uh, at the time growing and the time that he was actually living here, uh, he was uh, constantly reminded of the Lincoln legacy because it was right across the street from his home. And it was just kind of a uh, kitty corner. Uh, so we have a record uh, from uh, Avia Kemper Kepner, uh, who stated not only was he born in Springfield, his family home was kitty corner across the street from Abraham Lincoln's. Um, it was almost prophetic, she said. 
Uh, now, this lovely image was actually taken January 14th by Dave Blanchett, and it was featured in the Illinois Times. And there was a story that was told about uh, Rosenwald and his family living in Springfield. And if you were fortunate enough, about a year ago at the Painter Lectures at the Lincoln Home for Lincoln's birthday, there was a program on Julius Rosenwald's legacy. And there was a wonderful lady who uh, attended and was actually a part of the program for that evening uh, where she uh, told her remembrances of being a part of the Rosenwald schools. Now, before the schools were even started, um, we have Catherine back. Yay! All right, Catherine, can I bounce the ball to you? Can you uh, bounce the ball to me? And how are you bouncing the ball to me? Because I was gone for a few minutes, so I don't know what you've been up to, Annie. <laughs> well, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the African American Museum, and I will get us started with the slideshow um, when you are ready. All right, then. I have a bit of a glare on my glasses, but that's all right. And please disregard my wonderful background. <laughs> All right. Anyway, the Springfield and Central Illinois African American History Museum is at 1440 Monument Avenue. It is directly across the office of the uh, Oak Ridge Cemetery. And we encourage uh, people to come and visit us when we open again. Because of COVID, we have been closed and we are looking forward to opening, um, I believe our set date will be March the 4th. So I hope that people will come and visit us and see our wonderful exhibits that we have. Right now we have uh, exhibits about uh, African American women on stamps. We have an exhibit about African American first in Illinois and Central Illinois exhibits about the um, Obamas and a permanent exhibit that we have about um, the Middle Passage. So uh, those are some of the exhibits that we have and we do encourage everyone to come and see us. So I thank you all for, for that. Annie, I'm throwing it back to you. All right. So we are going to start off uh, where I kind of left off, um, which is um, we will be discussing the legacy of Julius Rosenwald uh, and we'll be talking about his character um, and how he developed some of that here in Springfield and how that expanded up to Chicago, Illinois and around the nation. Um, and Catherine is going to start us off by discussing uh, the early life of Julius Rosenwald and uh, the journey that he went on to um, discover the social change that he wanted to make in his life. Right. Um, people probably don't know that Julius Rosenwald uh, was born right here in Springfield in 1862, and he was raised in the Lincoln neighborhood. In fact, his home is uh, uh, kind of diagonally across the street from the um, from the Lincoln home. It's in the uh, Lincoln uh, National Park area uh, for, for Lincoln's home. He lived in this house that is shown here um, until he was about 16. One of the things that he did um, was that he was he sold um they weren't he sold flyers and that's how he first began be uh his his entrepreneurial work Ro Ro rosenwald um his father uh, according to the 1860 census he was a uh, a farmer but they lived there in this house, the diagonally kitty corner, across from the Lincoln home. Currently, this this uh, Rosenwald's home serves as the administrative uh, offices for the National National Park Service. 
Julius Rosenwald was one of the founding members uh, of the Sears and Roebuck, Sears and Roebuck Company, uh, of the Sears magazine. Sears catalog. I'm sure all of us remember growing up having a Sears catalog in our home, and we might have even called it the wish book because I remember growing up looking at it and just wishing I could have many of the things that was that that were included in there. Uh, Julius Rosenwall gained his fame and fortune with the Sears Roebuck Company. Uh, his um, partner, Richard Sears, was kind of not the very best uh, business person, but Rosenwald had a much better uh, business acumen and was able to turn around the uh, clothing business that uh, Richard Sears had started to make it very successful. One of the things that Julius Rosenwald is certainly known for was the mantra that he lived by. He uh, became a philanthropist and um, his uh, mantra was, give while you live. One of the things that he truly also believed in was much like Mr. Lincoln, in whose neighborhood he grew up, he was very much um, c committed to the idea that people had the right to rise. And by using the talents and hard work, everyone could improve his lot in life. He was um, concerned with the welfare of African Americans um, beginning in the early 1900s. And in 1917, he established the Rosenwald Fund, whose chief purpose was to, <laughs> was to uh, improve the life of African Americans. Julius Rosenwald became good friends with Booker T. Washington. Oh, we got a little typo there, but that's fine. Booker T. Washington. Um, and he was very much involved in the creation of the Tuskegee Institute because the Tuskegee Institute, as many of us know, which is now Tuskegee University, home of the Tuskegee Airmen uh, in, late, in later years. But in its early years, it was a school established for African-Americans so that they might learn trades and the use of their hands. And indeed, that would be the way that they would uh, improve their lot. Um, Booker T. Washington could be considered a person who was involved with the uplift of the race. And through his affiliation and the philanthropy of uh, Julius Rosenwald, he was indeed able to uh, improve the lot of many African Americans. Uh, one of the things is said right here on this current slide that is to be connected with an institution such as you and your and your splendid staff have created and it is deed a rare privilege. Rosenwald served on the board of uh, the Tuskegee Institute, today's Tuskegee University. Ro Rosenwald's uh, success and his philanthropy did not necessarily end with just the with the um, with, with his pardon me with, with his philanthropy to uh, Tuskegee Institute. In fact, through his thought of giving give while you live philosophy, he went on to build some. 5,000 plus schools for African Americans in the, in, in, in the South. Uh, not only did he build those 5,000 schools, but he also established and gave, um, he established the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago in 1929, and he contributed heavily to the, um, 
University of Chicago. Um, some of you may remember that a couple of summers ago, there was a showing uh, called Rosenwald um, about uh, Julius Rosenwald and his largesse here in Springfield that was, uh, that, that was sponsored by um, several uh, groups, including the African American History Museum, the Jewish Federation, Union Baptist Church, and it was very well received. The NAACP was involved uh, in sponsoring that film that told the story of Julius Rosenwald and his uh, largesse and his uh, gift of education, because he believed that education was the key and education continues to be the key for self-improvement then as well as now. Annie? Thank you, Catherine. Uh, that is where I'm leading in. Uh, I'm gonna in throw it back <laughs> to you. <laughs> so as uh, Catherine and I were talking about Julius Rosenwald, we were both at the uh, dedication of his house in Springfield uh, last February. Uh, where Catherine spoke on Julius Rosenwald and his legacy. And that was a big reason why I wanted her to be here is because she is very knowledgeable about his life. Um, one of the things that fascinated me uh, was the Rosenwald school itself um, and the passion that he had for education. So as we uh, turn to the Rosenwald schools, uh, I wanted to highlight some of the things that I was able to discover about Rosenwald uh, in the midst of all this. Uh, he gave to a lot of different programs throughout his life and Catherine mentioned a few of them, um, but he also uh, gave quite a bit to the YMCA, the YWCA, um, but he also supported the NAACP. In 1911, he gave $250, uh, which is uh, 52,000 in today's dollars if you add up um, his number of years putting it all together. Uh, in 1912, he donated 2,000 for legal work and 250 for general operating expenses. Uh, he gave quite a bit uh, to the NAACP here in, in the uh, Illinois area. And uh, one of his coworkers that he spent a lot of time with, and um, eventually he ended up writing a book about Rosenwald, um, Peter Ascoli, ended up stating, quote, he was very opposed to things like Birth of a Nation, which he tried to stop from being shown in Chicago. When there were terrible race riots in Chicago in 1919, he was horrified, absolutely horrified. Everything he was working towards was being undermined. He really believed, ultimately, hoped that blacks and whites could work together. Now, eventually, um, he would read some speeches and some works by Booker T. Washington, and they ended up having a very influential meeting uh, that made Roosevelt think he could do so much more than just donate to the NAACP, but also um, play a major role in um, pursuing better ed education for the African American population. Uh, so in 1911, Washington was seeking a new board member for Tuskegee, and he asked L. W. L. Wilbur Messler, a mutual friend of Washington and Rosenwald, to suggest a prominent white Chicagoan uh, for the Tuskegee Board of Trustees, and Messer named Rosenwald. Uh, at that time in 1911, Rosenwald hosted a luncheon for Washington and Chicago. Um, and at that time, Washington offered him the place uh, on the board for the Tuskegee Institute. Uh, Rosenwald and his family visited the Institute in October of 1911, um, and he was deeply impressed with what uh, Washington was able to create with Tuskegee. Uh, he goes on to state that, quote, I was astonished at the progressiveness in the school, and I don't believe there is a white industrial school in America or anywhere that compares to Mr. Washington's Tuskegee. So Rosenwald uh, was very 
uh, invested in the Tuskegee Institute, but he was also very saddened at the poverty that African-American communities that he saw in the South. Um, and he compared it to the difficulties that Jews faced in Europe, um, which he felt that uh, he could understand the plight of African-Americans that were trying to survive uh, in the Southern states. Uh, he goes on to write, quote, whether it is because I belong to a people who have known centuries of persecution or whether it is because I am naturally inclined to sympathize with the oppressed, I have always felt keenly for the colored race. And he wrote that in around 1911 when he was uh, having these conversations with uh, Washington on how he could uh, figure out a way to give funds uh, that would make the best change for these communities. So he decided to create a fund for uh, starting up a series of schools that would better communities uh, of the African American population in the South. And it all started from him giving towards scholarship funding and donations uh, to provide um, scholarships for students to attend Tuskegee. But then uh, Rosenwald ended up uh, wanting to provide African-American teachers for new schools. And so he donated around $25,000, um, which is around 648,000 in today's money uh, to, teach, to individuals who wanted to become teachers. Um, and he thought it was imperative that a stream of teachers would come out of the Tuskegee Institute. And the fund uh, was raised to try to build up uh, black schools in the South. And uh, he was speaking with Washington and he suggested to Rosenwald that he uh, fund construction for six rural schools, estimated at $600 each, which today is around 15,000. Um, if Rosenwald would provide half of this amount, the local African-American community would provide matching funds to create these schools. Um, and the schools that I have featured here are uh, three of the original six Rosenwald schools that were uh, put into creation. Um, and sorry if I mispronounced some of the names for some of these schools, but you have Lapochka School in Alabama, uh, which was one of the first that was completed in 1913. Um, then you have the Chiha, uh School that was in Alabama, uh, and it was one of the first as well uh, that was founded in 1914, and the P.D. Rosenwald School in Marion County, South Carolina. Now, the South Carolina Local History Museum has a wonderful collection of photographs as well as original desks, uh, chalkboards, uh, teacher desks, on display and uh, because of COVID people haven't been able to go and see it but they do have images online and in the midst of that South Carolina's uh, Historical Society is taking the extra step to recreate Rosenwald schools so then people can now walk into them and have that immersion experience on what it was like to walk into a school and what it looks like. Now when Rosenwald was working on these schools, um, he ended up stating four days later that he would agree to spend $2,800 on the rural schools, which is around $72,000 today. So he decided to give more than the original $600 to the first six schools, which I think is pretty cool for someone to have large sums of money and to give majority of it towards furthering education. Um, it shows the passion that he had, but also the determination to turn uh, the tide for African-Americans in the South who were struggling to gain a better education and make a better life for themselves. And also furthering the mission of the Tuskegee Institute, which is providing real life experience and education opportunities to further the lives of their students. So, uh, throughout uh, studying the schools, uh, you'll get a chance to, to see kind of the layouts of some of them, but I wanted to express the importance 
that Rosenwald had in not just giving money, but making sure that a community could feel pride in their schools and the pride in themselves for raising the other funds and contributing to the betterment of their communities. And that's a very important lesson that I think resonates to us today is you can't just expect people to, to heap loads of money onto programming without help from the community itself. And Rosenwald was able to show that within uh, his giving. Uh, he had a purpose to it, he had a lesson to it, and he wanted people to be able to help themselves as well. And so uh, one of the lines that uh, Washington ended up stating in a letter to Rosenwald um, in 1912, he stated, one thing I am convinced of, and that is that, sorry, I repeated it here, um, the best thing to have the people themselves build schoolhouses in their own community. I have found by investigation that many people who cannot give money would give half a day or a day's work, and others would give material in the way of nails, brick, lime, etc. So these Communities would put up signs uh, throughout town. Uh, they would pass flyers out and they would try to find uh, ways to raise money themselves. Um, here I have two uh, rallying posters that were uh, circulated in South Carolina and uh, some that were circulated in other states as well. But it shows that um, they had the AME Church get involved in raising funds uh, for some of the schools. We also have a series of uh, different large community members, so community members at large, who would come in and they would give speeches and try to uh, encourage people to give what they could. And if they couldn't, to show up on a work day, show up, uh, bring your hammer, uh, bring some energy because we are building a school. And that was something that Washington was encouraged by, uh, the fact that these individuals were willing uh, to take their time and effort to come in and build the school with their own two hands. Now, uh, as I went through uh, researching uh, the history of these schools, um, they, didn't really have too much of an issue trying to raise funds because people were so determined to provide educational opportunities that they were easily able to match the funds needed to supply schools. Um, one uh, individual who stated uh, within the research that I was able to do, there were a lot of personal accounts from people who were able to benefit from Rosenwald schools. And they described a little bit about what the experience was like to build the school within their community. Uh, Charlotte Reed Wood uh, ended up stating, quote, it was all family, everybody was involved, school was a big part of the community. Anything that was going on, the whole community participated. It was a family a family. And that was the biggest message that was shared throughout all the stories of these schools that were being built. It was a family opportunity. Um, Laverne Gray, uh, who was also a Rosenwald School graduate stated, quote, I love the fact that what Julius Rosenwald did was give seed money and that the way that they operated, it opened the community it opened the opportunity for the community to actually contribute and be a part of it. I love that partnership because it was not just between the two of them, it was between them and the community and that the people in the community, particularly the poor black people in rural areas who didn't have much anyway, had an opportunity to actually have something and be proud of it and help build it. I just think that's awesome. Uh, so in reading through some of the accounts, uh, you get a sense of pride from a lot of these communities that they were able to be a part of a, a bigger project. So what do these schools look like? Um, it's easy to talk about them uh, and, uh, and with uh, the National Park Service showing an interest, 
uh, and preserving some of the schools that do remain. Um, it's important to look at kind of their origin story. How were they built? Because the communities were building them and there had to be some sort of plans laid out. Well, here we have um, a, a community school here. You have at least four classrooms. There were some Rosenwald schools that were made up of just uh, two classrooms that split the building. Uh, you also have some that were a little smaller that had only one classroom. So when you look at uh, the way that the school was built, um, you have four here that were easily uh, separated by walls, but uh, you had to go through um, a particular stairwell to get to each one. And then you had the vestibule area, which allowed you to um, enter the classroom, but then you also had an area where two classrooms would share a space for them to actually um, store kind of like their coats, their boots, and those kinds of things. Um, there also uh, wasn't your traditional bathroom within the school. They had kind of like an outhouse uh, that was set up in the back um, and it had facilities for all the students. Um, and they even had plans drawn up uh, to make that sanitary and available. So you have a few of the um, individuals that were put in place by Washington to help set up the training sessions for teachers uh, to get them prepared to go into these communities to teach. Um, and then you also have a branch of the Tuskegee Institute within these schools. Um, so if you are trying to figure out what's going on in this particular uh, photograph, uh, they're teaching not just common education, like learning to read, write, and uh, perform their sums, um, but they're also teaching them some uh, industrial tasks that they can use later on uh, within their life. Um, one of the biggest uh, and important legacies of these schools was focused on everyone working together uh, to form a better uh, community and to provide better resources. And as you uh, are able to, just like with the African American History Museum doing their talks on uh, the Green Book, I hope you're able to go throughout the nation and see some of the, the schools that have been preserved um, and the legacy that they have left behind. So, uh, as we journey on, the earliest schools were started around 1912, and it started with six schools. Well, they grew. Um, as the, the schools expanded, uh, there were over 5,295 model schools for the Rosenwald uh, school districts. So by uh, 1932, the Rosenwald Fund grew uh, at a large rate because Rosenwald wasn't just donating, you had other donors giving to the fund. You also had communities buying in because of course they had to provide half the funds to get the school up and running, which paid for the teacher, the building, um, and provided some scholarshiping for students who were not able to afford going to school. And uh, you had uh, these schools provided in communities that needed them. And that was the important aspect, the location of the school that made it easy enough for students to be able to get to them, uh, that it wasn't so far out of the way that it took them uh, a bus ride, a car ride, or even having to walk long distances to get there. So after Washington's death in 1915, Tuskegee was unable to maintain the program. And in 1919, the Rosenwald Fund took control of the school's construction. Um, and this was stated in the New York Times. 5,295 model schools for Negroes have been distributed over 877 count counties in 15 southern states, directly affecting a school constituency of over 650,000 pupils, but indirectly influencing the whole public school system of the South in the most constructive and humanitarian 
uh, advance it has made in the last half generation. One shudders to think what would have been the present state of race relations had not these 5,000 beacons of light shone through the years. And that was in January 16th of 1932. Now, in looking at the development of these schools, um, you get a chance to see uh, the huge impact that Rosenwald had, not through his funds, but through the connections with these communities. Um, so in looking at this, there was uh, the quote that I have here is by Neil, who did a uh, evaluation of the Rosenwald schools. He says, these schools also were the most architecturally advanced school plans at the time. The initial designers for the Rosenwald program included architect Robert Taylor, the first black graduate of MIT, who was considered the first professional black architect in America. George Washington Carver was the landscape designer. So if you take a closer look, uh, Rosenwald didn't just affect the communities, he also affected rising stars. Um, who would eventually come in uh, to the humanities, into in, um, the biz business world, industries, um, and also defining uh, a new way of thinking in regards to the school system. Now, uh, Rosenwald schools operated until the landmark Brown versus uh, Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954, abolishing segregation. Some stayed open for many years as states fought the ruling and many schoolhouses are still standing today uh, and are used as community centers and as of January became national landmarks. I bring up uh, here the legacy of the Rosenwald schools. You have a series of individuals who came through who made huge impacts. Uh, I was excited to find that Maya Angelou was a Ro Rosenwald school graduate um, and she really enjoyed it. There's a uh, actual and oral history of her talking about um, her experience at Rosenwald schools. Um, you also had individuals such as John Lewis, who stated, quote, I was absolutely committed to giving everything I had to bettering myself in the classroom. I had no doubt that there was a way out of the world I saw around me and that this was the way. My parents, like most poor black parents of that time, agreed. To them, education represented an almost mythical key to the kingdom of America's riches, the kingdom so long denied our race. Now, this is a picture of Lewis when he attended Rosenwald. Um, and uh, it's kind of blurry because it was actually kind of tiny. Uh, it's one of your typical like school photographs that you would hand out to your friends, except back then uh, you would keep them and only give them to family members. Um, and he was one of the uh, many graduates of the Rosenwald schools. Now, as I spoke about these schools and Catherine talked about the legacy that was left behind uh, by Rosenwald, it's very important to mention uh, the individuals who have strived so hard in making sure that these schools um, succeeded. And that's thanks to a lot of the individuals who graduated from the Rosenwald School Districts. Um, Marion Coleman, a graduate of Noble Hill School, um, which was a Rosenwald School, stated, when the school was built, there was a lot of pride, especially in the community. It was a new building. It wasn't an old building. The important fact that this is new, built by them, and supported by them, it made dreams possible for these students that entered the school building. Um, something that was theirs and something that they could take pride in. Uh, Corinthia Ridgely Boone, 
who went on to earn her PhD in philosophy and counseling, graduated from Rosenwald as well. And she states, quote, oh yes, you were expected to be somebody. Our teachers wanted us to be contributors to society. So she talked about the passion that her teachers had. Later on, um, you, uh, Lirana Gross, who became a mathematical statistician, who became the first high-ranking black woman administrator at the Census Bureau, who also graduated from a Rosenwald school, stated, quote, the school prepared me for higher education. You were taught to learn all you can. What you know cannot be taken from you. They can take away your opportunity, we were told, but they cannot take away what you know. So in sharing this story, I want to, to stress that the Rosenwald schools, while there's not a Rosenwald school here in Illinois, um, Illinois had a citizen who cared enough to give and cared enough to not count as many dollars that he was able to save up. Um, he decided to just jump at the opportunity to make his community and lives better for others. And it's definitely something that we have, as a community can look to for um, inspiration to help preserve the legacies that we have here that are just starting. Uh, the young children in our school districts uh, who gain the support from their school boards, their community and their schools are able to grow and prosper thanks to community members taking a step up and making sure that they are well taken care of, are in an environment where they can learn, and that people from all different backgrounds can benefit from a good education. And I might like to add a good resource of literature to read and devour. Rosenwald saw that and he saw a need and he jumped at it. Um, and it's a very inspiring story. And thanks to um, our Senator Dick Durbin for presenting it to the Senate and having it passed and signed by the President of the United States to have the Rosenwald schools dedicated and preserved, at least the ones that are standing, and to save the birthplace home of Rosenwald so that his legacy and the story of those who benefited from his generosity uh, get to have their story told. Um, and that's something that we can take great pride in. Um, here in Springfield, but also throughout the nation. So I'm going to bring Catherine back on to the stream so we can close out. Um, we may have some questions here. Um, so Jan, uh, Jan, I can't pronounce your last name, I'm sorry. Uh, but Jan said the film was very informative. Uh, Jane Raycamp. Huh? Her name is Jan Drakamp. Oh, great. I'm glad you're able to pronounce it. Thank you, Jan, for your understanding. Um, and uh, yes, the, the film was very informative. And that's actually where I got a bulk of my sources for the Rosenwald project. Um, but there is a there's still a Rosenwald fund. And so there are still funds being raised to preserve the current schools. So if you're interested in giving to that fund, uh, just go to the Rosenwald Fund in Google and you will have the, the first pop up is the, the national fund that you can give to. Um, and also, thankfully, our taxes go to preserving the National Park Service. Uh, and so just paying our taxes also helps to uh, preserve uh, the legacy of the Rosenwald schools. Um, one of our questions um, that Catherine, I think we can tag team on, is from uh, Brooke. She asks, um, did the Spanish flu alter plans for the schools? Um, the Spanish I've, flu- did I've not seen anything in reference to that, but the Spanish flu certainly would have been um, in 1918, in the pandemic, much like we have today, um, it was dur during the time, so it probably did have some effect on some of the construction. Maybe the construction was slowed in some of the places 
because of the pandemic. Have you found anything about that in your work, Annie, in your research? Um, I'm actually very fortunate to be married to a uh, medical historian. So um, it was one of the questions that I asked him, uh, which was how did the Spanish flu affect just schools in general? Uh, that's a conversation we have quite a bit because we, in living in a pandemic right now, we want to know, okay, how did it affect us back then? Did people follow the rules? Did they wear masks? Did they um, have proper sanitation? Um, and during the Spanish flu, I mean, sanitation was kind of a, a nuance almost, because uh, right after the Civil War, that's when washing your hands started to started to go into vogue, <laughs> so to speak. Um, but back then, I mean, people were mandated to wear masks to schools. And so I would um, believe, based off of the research that uh, Mr. Mosley has done, and including myself, um, that students were mandated to wear masks when they came to school, um, just like they were having to wear them everywhere else. Um, so it did affect uh, class sizes. Uh, it also affected uh, the building of school and how many people who were available. But just because there was a flu, it didn't stop people from doing what they needed to do and what they felt was very important. Um, they followed guidelines and just kept moving um, because that was the lifestyle that they had back then. You had to keep moving because if you stopped, then opportunities would disappear. Um, and opportunities were definitely needed at this time. We have other questions, Annie? Uh, yes, we have one from Marla. She stated, what is the best resource other than the film for information about Rosenwald? Well, I can bring that up you here. I actually have a, your, a local public, your local public. Your local public? You can certainly go to your local public library and find all kinds of resources. And even though um, I am a librarian, the Internet still does have some very good resources uh, for uh, resources about Julius Rosenwald and the, Ro and the Rosenwald schools. Um, I have a book that I can show. Can you see it? It's about a uh, schools of hope, which is about uh, the Rosenwald schools, and it does, of course, talk about Rosenwald as a as the philanthropist that he was, and many of the uh, many of the organizations that he he gave to. He gave a great deal of money to the uh, Wabash Y in Chicago, for example, and that still stands today. It was one of the first um, uh, Y W YMCA's that uh, that existed in 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 the nation and still it uh, still stands in Chicago. Julius Rosenwald was a he was a phenomenal person who looked ahead and was very much into um, helping uh, African Americans achieve. And he found that education was the key to that. And education is always the key. Education, education, education. It's the key to self-improvement. Well, in a, in a lot of the pictures that you saw in my slides uh, had um, Dusich on it. D-E-U-T-S-C-H. Uh, mm -hmm. Deutsch. Uh, Deutsch. The huh? Deutsch, yes. It's, it's Deutsch. Because <laughs> um, it's German. <laughs> it is German. <laughs> Uh, it's a good thing I I, I didn't go and, and learn German back in school. <laughs> um, so since it was a last name, I thought it, he pronounced it. So kind of like the Carolines and the Carolines. But uh, anyway, so in a lot of those pictures, I have um, his last name listed. So mm -hmm. the book that I use for the images and for some of my information came from the book you Need a Schoolhouse, Booker T. Washington, Julius Rosenwald, and the Building of Schools for Segregated South. Um, it right. was a part of the Northwestern University Press, uh, and it was published in 2011. Um, that is one that I, I, I recommend. Um, you also have the book Julius Rosenwald, Repairing the World, 
uh, that was published in 2017. Um, and then you have um, Wandering Dixie Dispatches from the Lost Jewish South. And that actually was published this past year um, by H. Diner. Um, there's a long list. Uh, if you are interested in learning more, um, I definitely will be able to provide those in the notes here. Um, but if you go to the Julius Rosenwald and Rosenwald Schools National Historic Park campaign, um, and I'll put that in the links here, um, you'll get a chance to see their book list. And with that, uh, you'll be able to find a plethora of books, so a multitude of them. Um, another question comes from Marla. Did he face opposition to the creation of schools? I'll, I'll kind of tackle that. From what we know about him, the only people who would have been opposed would have been people who did not who looked like him, who were white. But I'm certain that the schools that he created for the benefit of African Americans, there was no opposition from them. But you have to just remember the time that this is going on, which is at a time where segregation and racism is quite rampant in our in our country. And uh, so there, the opposition would have not from people who look like him, but from people... <laughs> Uh, the opposition would have come if there was any from um, from whites, certainly not from African Americans, because they saw the value of what he was doing. I always thought 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 it was interesting that uh, a lot of the Rosenwald schools, because uh, oftentimes, you know, the community might not have had a lot of money to give, but they gave sweat equity, as we would call it today. Uh, they had uh, bake sales and uh, church church parties and things like that to raise money. That's how committed they were to wanting to have a school in their community. Because he did not just give the schools. The community had to do their part as well to make it come to pass. Well, I think because that's very important. It was very encouraging, Catherine, to have the community involvement. And that's um, that's something that I think a lot of people can resonate with because um, you don't want to just give a handout. And right. he, he believed that um, if you gave people money, it helped them out for the time being, but it wouldn't help them out in the long run. In the um, long run, right. And so for him, it was important. To, to see that, okay, do you really want this? Do you really want to have education? Um, and not doubting it, but just more of, there's also a sense of pride uh, that individuals have, and um, they don't want to just be given something, they want to have earned it. And so uh, a lot of times he saw that within himself, and he also saw it in others. Um, and that I think made his philanthropy even more uh, uh, impactful on these communities because he didn't just provide funds, he provided um, a work ethic in a way uh, to take pride in, in what you're invested in. Well, we have other questions because our, our time is getting close right. here. I don't have any others listed. Um, if you are interested in learning more about Rosenwald, I encourage you to uh, check out your local library, but also I put, I posted the uh, historic park campaign uh, in the chat for you to be able to go and find a book list. Uh, there is a book list listed in their menu options. Um, also, I encourage you to uh, visit Springfield and visit his uh, historic home. Uh, they have a really nice uh uh, informative sign on the outside of the building that you'll be able to see. Uh, given right now, the temperatures are very cold. And so feel free to uh, come back uh, to Springfield when it's a little warmer to take a look at the house. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to send us an email at experience at uis.edu. 
And also, uh, I want to thank Catherine for coming on board and talking to us a little bit about Julius Rosenwald and his legacy. Um, I know that uh, the African American History Museum here in Springfield um, will probably be doing a little bit more research into his life and the story of individuals who were impacted uh, by the Rosenwald schools. Um, but feel free to tune in for future programming that we have here at the Singerman Experience. Uh, we will be uh, releasing a new exhibit March 1st um, and it's called Hometown Pride. And what I would like you to do, if you were encouraged by Rosenwald's uh, act of philanthropy, I would encourage you to reach out to us and tell us uh, a story of someone who gave in your community here in Sangamon County, uh, whether it be to schools, to a charitable organization, a church, um, and the projects that they worked on to make uh, their town thrive. Um, that is something that we would like to highlight here is uh, individuals who made a difference within our communities. Thank you again, Catherine, for joining us. And thank you uh, yes. to all who attended virtually. Uh, we truly appreciate you turn, tuning in. Uh, if you came in a little late to the program, uh, this will be recorded on YouTube as well as on our Facebook page. And uh, you'll be able to tune in next month uh, where we speak with Erica Holtz about the early women of Sangamon County. So tune in uh, for that. And we'll see you next time. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you.